So I'm a consultant with EDF, was one of the leads in both the design and implementation of the Cities Initiative. The Cities Initiative set out to convene cities and towns in North Carolina that were actively working to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, to have them identify barriers to achieving their greenhouse gas reduction goals in North Carolina, and then identify and prioritize solutions around those. When we looked at North Carolina, we really saw a critical mass of local governments that were working on greenhouse gas reductions. There were a dozen cities and towns in the state where the mayors had signed the mayor's letter committing their communities to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by their proportional shares called for under the Paris Accords, plus several other cities that were working actively to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we really wanted to focus this effort on barriers that had an impact across a swath of North Carolina. So not an issue that a local government could address on their own. So not, we don't have enough budget or we don't have enough staff. And by the same token, also not things at the national level. If something resides at FERC, we weren't looking at that. We think there are a lot of folks that are actively doing that. But we thought there was a real need for those local governments that are working on greenhouse gas in initiatives to look at the ecosystem in North Carolina. So in terms of participants, um, we had roughly from east to west, Wilmington, Cary, Raleigh, Hillsborough, Durham, Chapel Hill, Carborough, Greensboro, Winston, Charlotte, Asheville, and Highland. So one, a good geographic mix as you think about going across the state. But also we were really pleased it wasn't just the larger cities and towns in the state, but we actually had representatives from some smaller communities. We did a lot of design work on the front end of this, talking to mayors, staff, uh, the state of North Carolina, COGS, uh, NGOs that worked with municipalities as well as around some of these issues around greenhouse gas emissions to make sure that we designed a program that was going to have an impact but also that provided enough value to the participants they'd be willing to commit the time. So what we did is we sent a letter to the mayors, asking, inviting them to participate in the city's initiative, asking them to designate a staff member to participate in four roundtables and have elected officials participate in the final one. Um, Twelve cities that came on board, we did an initial survey with them to gather information about their greenhouse gas goals. Did it apply to city operations? Was it for the whole community? How was the goal put in place? Um, their experience so far around barriers, around partnerships they'd put in place, partnerships they were interested in. That was a really important tool for EDF in terms of how we designed the roundtables and the facilitation strategy. And it's, I do want to say that EDF's role in this was as convener and facilitator. So EDF didn't come in with a pre, uh, preconceived set of, hey, these are the issues that need to be addressed or here are the solutions that need to be put forward, but really wanted to be in the role of that convening, bringing folks together and getting the cities through that process. So out of that survey, we did a series of four half-day roundtables. They were hosted in communities and participating communities around the state. Um, we went from July to November. The first one, uh, we had a kickoff remarks from Secretary Regan. Uh, Susan Maysmore gave us a, a sneak peek at the greenhouse gas inventory report for the state. But we spent the bulk of the time in small groups really identifying issues for those that they had around greenhouse gas reductions. At the end of the session, we had over 60 issues that had been surfaced. We spent some time with those, and they fell neatly into four buckets. So utility, finance, transportation, energy efficiency. Some of the issues were in two buckets. Pace was in both finance and energy efficiency. But that was the framework that we took into the second roundtable. So we spent time in moderated working groups on each of those areas to identify issues, do prioritization, and then collectively the cities prioritized the issues that come up. And they came up with six issues that they thought were important to address. So we took those six issues into the third roundtable where we focused on identifying solutions. This roundtable is a little different, and then we brought in outside partners that could serve as technical experts, folks that could talk about how things currently work in North Carolina, uh, potential solutions to consider, what they'd seen in other states. We had Chris Ayers and the public staff. We had representatives from Duke Energy, a, a range of experts from NGOs and universities on, a, on different topics. We were really explicit, though, that the role of these third parties was to serve as technical experts. They didn't get a say in what solutions should be considered or the prioritization. That was left to the municipal participants. Um, so out of that roundtable, they identified solutions, they prioritized those, and that rolled into the culmination in November where the cities identified their 12 consensus action items. These are the priority solutions that they wanted, they thought were most important. They looked at impact, uh, they looked at difficulty, and how they matched with their goals. Um, I'm not going to read all these, um, but 
they hit a range of topics from transportation, data access, renewable energy uh, availability, building codes. Um, and they also um, can be addressed in a number of different ways. Some of these require legislation. Some require it could be done through administrative action or regulatory. And some are done by partnership. I'll give you just a couple of examples. So create a utility building platform that helps cities and customers understand energy use. Duke Energy is working on developing a new building platform. There's real interest among the cities in partnering with Duke Energy to have local governments partner as beta testers so they can make sure that the building platform supported their needs for program design, their own utility management, and their goals around greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, another one, incorporate greenhouse gas scoring for state-funded projects. So there's a range of programs that the state has that fund projects and communities from transportation improvement program, CMAC, uh, Clean Water Management Trust Fund, Parks and Rec uh, Trust Fund, Revolving Loan Fund for Water Projects, etc. They generally have scoring rubrics. So the thought was, if you have congestion mitigation, safety innovation, why not have greenhouse gas impact? That would not only be a funding source to make it easier to get projects funded and in place to improve greenhouse gas impact, but also require everybody across the state that was applying for those funds to measure the greenhouse gas impact of the projects they proposed. So with this one, again, kind of a range, there were some of those changes that would require legislation because the scoring rubrics are in statute. There's others that could be done administratively. So these are the items that came out. Um, it was really timely. This was in November. EO80 came out in, in October. Um, there's been a lot of interest for this agenda, a lot of appetite from this voice from the local governments to say, hey, here are our priorities. And that's been certainly with the Cooper administration, through the UNC Clean Tech Summit, the App Energy Summit. Um, some of our city participants, Duke Energy and DEQ, just recently did an RMI eLab accelerator uh, just a few weeks ago to address some of the issues that came up here. And so that's a work in progress, but really exciting. But where do we go from here? Uh, so we're in the process of launching phase two. It'll launch next month. It's going to uh, develop strategies for those consensus action items. The idea is we've got these. We've set this agenda. Um, that voice is here in the clean energy plan planning process. But these local governments are going to get together and develop their strategies for each of these about what role they can play in getting these put in place. Now, each one of those is really a, in a different project, if you think about it. It's going to have different stakeholders, different process involved. So we'll sequence through those over the next two years. Um, the 12 existing communities that participated are going to be there, as well as we've opened it up to all counties, cities, and towns that are interested in participating. We've got a number of new participants that are coming on board, several others with discussions, but we're actively recruiting. Um, DEQ was kind enough to set up a web page for the Cities Initiative. If you Google DEQ Cities Initiative, it's one of the top results in Google. It has a summary of Phase 1, Phase 2, and it's also got a hyperlink to a presentation that gives you a couple pages on each of those solutions so you can dive deeper if you're interested in those, as well as contact information for folks that are interested in participating. Um, Dion, anything you think I left out? Uh, there, just one additional thing, there is some sort of parallel conversation starting with some of the universities because there are very um, similar issues that they are facing, so we're uh, exploring those conversations also. Thanks. Uh, nice to see you all. Nice to be here. My name is Brianna Estives. I am the state lead for North Carolina State Policy at Ceres. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, Ceres is a sustainability nonprofit. We're national in scope, but we work primarily with the private sector on building a more sustainable economy. Uh, we were founded by a group of investors. Uh, we have a network of 160 investors strong. They're institutional investors, um, asset managers like BlackRock, State Street, um, small um, environmentally responsible investors as well, and also some of the nation's largest pension funds are part of our investor network. Uh, we also have a company network where I work with primarily Fortune 500 companies looking at their internal sustainability, at their operations and their supply chain. And most relevant to this discussion, we have a network of 52 companies uh, known as BICEP. It's our policy network. Uh, it's a business for innovative climate and energy policy. These are 52 companies. A lot of these logos you'll recognize uh, they have all signed up um, to advocate for strong policies on climate change, uh, clean, electri clean electricity, clean transportation at the U.S. state and federal level. Uh, a lot of these folks uh, have operations here in North Carolina. We've got breweries like uh, New Belgium, Sierra Nevada, um, retailers like uh, Gap and Starbucks and Levi's and Ikea, um, you know, other folks, uh, Mars Incorporated, uh, 
folks might know them for their, their M&Ms and their Snickers. They also have a really large pet care uh, business. And so they have over 1,300 employees in North Carolina uh, in the pet care side manufacturing plant. Unilever has manufacturing. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, but in addition to these folks, uh, we work with a number of partners across the state, um, primarily uh, other large energy users that are also key partners. I see Jerry back there in the room. Hey there. <laughs> um, and and um, we've been working in nor with companies in North Carolina for, for a little over four years now. Um, so why are companies engaging in policy? Well, uh, they have strong commitments to clean energy. Um, across the U.S. and across the globe, uh, there are folks committing to power all their operations with 100% renewable energy. Folks are committing to double their energy productivity by a certain deadline. They're committing to uh, increase their, um, electrify their fleets and increase workplace charging at their facilities. Um, and then also, there are over 500 companies, um, major companies that have set science-based targets. So that is looking across their supply chain, across their operations, and the end use of their products, looking at the greenhouse gas um, emissions from those operations, and trying to uh, figure out how to keep those um, within doing their part to, to keep emissions below two degrees Celsius. Um, and then here in North Carolina, so more than half of the 30 largest employers of the state uh, have set clean energy commitments that are public. Um, there are at least 37 companies that have 100% renewable energy commitments. Um, and, and below here is an example of companies that have um, installed solar or wind here in the state. Um, I'll have a, make a caveat to this that a lot of this solar or wind um, are you know, company owned on site facilities or most of them are in that little region of, of PJM in North Carolina um, carved out utilizing the wholesale market. So why are companies engaging in policy? Why are they setting these commitments? Uh, it's, for some of them, it might be out of the goodness of their heart, but that's not the case for most of these folks. There's real business case for clean energy. And so uh, clean energy, as we all know, helps folks uh, reduce costs. There's a real energy savings um, possibility there, um, and, and businesses know that. It also helps businesses diversify their energy supply, um, and then also, importantly, lock in long-term energy prices. Uh, they don't have to, a lot of the businesses want to, to focus on their products and their services. They don't want to have to think about volatility uh, of fossil fuel prices. And so this helps them um, maintain that uh, stability for a while and not have to worry. Um, and then also a big part of this is meeting expectations. Um, we work with a lot of shareholders and they have expectations of companies creating long-term value. Uh, and being sustainable uh, in their operations. Um, certainly customers are looking for companies to uh, be responsible uh, in, in the way they do business. And then employees, it's also about attracting talent. Um, you know, today some of the top uh, talented employees are looking to work for companies that they feel good about uh, and in states where, where they feel like, uh, you know, they're, they're proud to be there. So, why am I here today? Uh, one of the big reasons is that a number of companies that we work with uh, just last month submitted a letter asking for more uh, clean energy and, and bolder clean energy policies in North Carolina. Um, this letter was submitted last month to the General Assembly and also to the Cooper administration. Um, and the letter kind of laid out four key buckets. Uh, the first was, one, using energy more efficiently and eliminating waste. Second recommendation, increase customer access to renewable energy. The third was to accelerate the deployment of electric vehicles. And the fourth is to promote the deployment of energy storage. So I'll go through a little bit of those in a little bit more detail. Um, so first, in regards to using energy efficiency more, uh, using more energy efficiency, um, these numbers shouldn't come up to surprise for folks. Um, these are numbers, rankings um, from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Every year they do a really thorough ranking of where states are on energy efficiency. Um, North Carolina ranks about uh, mid-rank, so certainly not leading on energy efficiency overall. Um, but one number I'd like to point out there is that r the state ranks 30th on utility energy efficiency. Um, which is certainly not a leadership position. Um, but um, just a little fact here that, that in 2018, uh, North Carolina utilities saved about 0.4% um, on energy, whereas other states, particularly those with um, energy efficiency resource standards, are saving upwards of 1%, some more than 2% annually. 
Um, and so here are just a few suggestions in the interest of time, I won't go through them. But I will show you, um, so this is a letter that a number of companies submitted to the General Assembly last year supporting a lead by example program that was also in the governor's executive order increasing um, the, the energy efficiency goal for state buildings. Um, and the companies uh, in other states uh, across the country have also supported um, strong energy efficiency resource standards, strong building codes that take into account um, more, more energy efficiency in the built environment, et cetera. Um, and then one of the major recommendations that we've been hearing from a lot of companies in North Carolina is increasing uh, customer access to renewable energy. Um, a report from the Retail Industry Leader Association and ITI uh, did a ranking on the, the environment for corporate clean energy procurement across the U.S. North Carolina ranked 30th, so not great there. Um, but it's also, um, you know, folks know in this room that the regulatory structure um, really limits choice and competition. Um, and access to renewable energy. Um, so a few suggestions uh, of what we're hearing from companies and what they want to see. I mean, ultimately they want more options, they want more choice, and they want to see competition. Um, so certainly they want to be able to work with their utilities for green tariff options that work for them, um, don't, that don't just work for you know, a small subset of companies that are more accessible. Um, they want to be able to have more choice in the energy marketplace. Um, they want to be able to you know, have access to third-party PPAs, um, have access to the wholesale market if, if that's what they're looking for. And then certainly there are ways to remove barriers like using interconnection standards to make it easier for companies uh, to get to renewables. Um, and so these are just a couple of examples. Um, so, so this is an example of a letter that some major companies in North Carolina sent to lawmakers. Uh, this is from 2015, um, but essentially they're asking for more choice, uh, more energy choice. And this letter in particular was supporting um, the Energy Freedom Act, which, was, which would legalize uh, third-party on-site PPAs at minimum. And then um, this is an example of a letter from uh, during House Bill 589, where companies were commending the state and, and for legislatures for um, for um, legalizing third-party leasing, but also looking at the green source rider, green source advantage program as an area for significant improvement for them to be able to access renewables. And then I also wanted to share this graphic with you all. Uh, so this is a, a graphic of. Um, corporate renewable energy procurement across the U.S. And these numbers are in gigawatts, it's hard to see. But in 2018, uh, corporations procured, uh, and these are major projects, but more than 6.5 gigawatts of renewable energy across the U.S. Um, what this graph shows is two things. So one, it shows that corporate procurement has gone mainstream, particularly in 2018. Uh, in, in the earlier days, um, it was mostly tech companies and some of the early movers um, that were, you know, experimenting with this, but now other companies through all different types of sectors, all different sizes, are procuring renewable energy. They know there's a business case for it, um, and this is just this, the trend that we're going to see continue. Um, and then the second thing is that this, um, this shows that there's a lot of opportunity for not only investment, uh, for tax revenue, but also to attack, attract companies. And so, uh, you know, a lot of companies want to have renewable energy procurement near where their operations are. Um, so. So being able to create a more welcoming environment for these investments will help North Carolina reap these benefits as well. And then quickly, I know I only have a minute left, um, accelerating the deployment of electric vehicles is also um, an important um, factor. So a lot of companies are transitioning their fleets. They're, they know that there's a real business case for EVs, particularly over the last recent years, costs have come down. You can access uh, long-term savings. Um, so really policies that create a favorable, in, in favorable environment for EV investments and, <laughs> um, and, um, and infrastructure will be helpful in opportunities for partnerships and incentives. What have you, these are examples um, from other states of companies weighing in. Um, one is in Colorado supporting the Advanced Clean Cars program, so adoption of LEV and ZEV, um, low emission vehicle programs and standards. Um, and another one is an example of companies in New Jersey supporting policy um, legislation that would um, set a goal for EV adoption, um, inc include rebates, and then have an infrastructure plan as well. And then the last plan was promoting energy storage. Um, we all know storage technologies are here today and that the costs have come down significantly and businesses know that too, and so they want to see more energy storage become part of grid planning um, 
uh, and I'll leave it at that because timing, <laughs> my time is low. Um, and then the last thing I'll say before I depart, I know carbon pricing has come up um, and I didn't include it in the presentation, and I apologize, but uh, we also work with a number of businesses that are very supportive of carbon pricing. They've supported the carbon cap in Virginia, they've supported Reggie, uh, Microsoft and others have supported uh, carbon tax in Washington, and then today actually a series is on Capitol Hill with 75 businesses educating um, Congress about the importance of a carbon price. So. That is all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for coming in. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Brianna. Okay. We have five minutes uh, for Q&A before we go into our first round of presentations. Um, so, all right. We already have one in the back. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Reminder. Uh, yeah. Hi. I'm Elvis Presley. No, I'm just kidding. Steve <laughs> Gallen. Uh, Brianna, I had a quick question. So some of the recommendations that you had centered around things that we actually saw get passed in House Bill 589 last year, uh, you know, green tariff program, uh, the leasing program, some of these things. I was just curious as to how your members are reacting to those, those provisions as they've been passed and as they're starting to be implemented. Yeah, that is a great question. Glad this mic works. Um, so certainly, uh, the folks that we work with are very happy to see leasing, and I think that um, it, you know, we'll we'll see the implementation is starting now. So so it's glad to see that as an option. Um, I think in in regards to the green source advantage, um, I think there are uh, a small. If it, you know t small number of companies that are um, able to utilize that program, I think, and they're in, uh, they're um, looking through that now. But most of them, uh, their reaction has been that this program is just not going to work for us. Um, it's either because of legislative caps on on, on certain numbers, and, and the legislation uh, needs to be fixed. Um, or, you know, just overall looking at the cost and I mean, they should be able to save money or at minimum break even um, and, and, you know, the way that they want to be able to structure these deals are just not as, uh, as flexible as they need to be. Great. And in the back. Yeah, uh, Zach, why, why didn't the uh, Green Source Advantage program get uh, attention in the uh, process you ran? Um, well, one, the process was driven by the cities, but it actually is explicitly in one of the um, renewable, uh, the greater access to renewable energy. Um, it, it is in that, that they did identify. Okay, and the gentleman right next to you. Yeah, the one question I had about, this is also for Series and for Zach. Uh, I noticed that electric cooperatives, which are where a lot of the renewables are growing nationwide, I deal with stuff all over with plants being shut down. I noticed they're not mentioned a whole lot. I uh, noticed that also uh, some of the folks like Nextera, the folks who are specialize in that, are not mentioned a whole lot. Just curious why that is, because uh, that's a great place to get it going. I think you're totally right. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, as I'm sure you know, I mean, the, a lot of the innovation is happening at the co-op level because there's a little bit more flexibility. And so we're seeing companies um, being able to work with their co-ops more than, than some of the, um, you know, traditional investor owned utilities. And so um, I think, you know, maybe that's why some of, a lot of their time is, is on the investor owned utilities because they see, a, you know, a more flexible system with the co-ops. And so EDF is actually doing a lot of work with co-ops on bill financing other places in North Carolina. Uh, with the city's initiative, we really went to where the cities were that we had, uh, where we could easily identify that had greenhouse gas reduction as a priority. And by coincidence, they're all in Duke's territory. So that was really driven by where we found the participants who were already working on greenhouse gas emissions, not yeah. something we set out to do on the front end. Right, and I guess the other thing, and this is just me thinking out loud, um, Duke is certainly much more driven by the regulatory policy framework, whereas co-ops are governed by their boards. So not that that's not an important piece, but as we look at sort of the, the government piece of the statewide ecosystem, it's definitely going to have a lot more direct impact on Duke than it is on the co-ops, just based how they're governed in the state. Okay, we have time for one more question. I, I hope you guys are going to the same person. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Molly Diggins with Sierra Club. Zach, this question is for you with the uh, exciting program you're working on. 
Numerous communities in North Carolina have already adopted decarbonization resolutions, but they're somewhat hamstrung as to what they can do because of North Carolina's Dillon or quasi Dillon status. Can you address, given the limitations on local authority, is the project looking at what communities can do today without having to seek policy changes or um, legislation? So, thanks, Molly. So, we explicitly didn't want to look at things that local governments could already do on their own, and that we felt there were a lot of people that are actively working in that space from best practices. So, if you want to do lighting retrofits or whatever, there are a lot of folks that were providing those resources, and we didn't want to be duplicative. Um, so, we really did focus on barriers, the things that these solutions could reduce the cost, increase the speed, or open up new avenues for greenhouse gas reduction. Okay, great. Thank you. Can I get another round of applause for our presenters?